Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about non-target analysis, which um, I'm a little sad the acronym math series is coming to an end, but it's my favorite topic, so I'm pretty excited for it. Uh, so we're going to get into just what are some of the basics and, and how can you get started sort of in this, this task that sometimes may seem a little bit overwhelming. Before we dive into it, in case you missed the first two series, um, and particularly the last one, there's just a couple of things I want to reintroduce and get kind of to the top of your mind um, because we're going to use it a lot when we talk about non-target analysis. And the first is how we communicate confidence. Uh, so this was kind of a topic of discussion back in the early 2000s. Uh, the metabolomics community really kind of spearheaded this for us, talking about how do we communicate confidence in an identification. When can we be confident? Yes, this is the compound of interest versus uh, it, it might be, but I'm not sure. That can still be really important data. We want to capture that. Um, but how do we tell our scientists, our community, that this is what we're seeing? Um, and it evolved through the years. I think the most commonly used sort of forms of this now would be the Shemansky index or AC. Um, I'm going to primarily talk about the Shemansky index just because that's the one that I think is more commonly used. Um, but they're pretty similar. There's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, but when we talk about sort of these confidence intervals, we start at a level five. Um, so a level five would be we have a feature. And when I fe say feature, I mean we just have a, essentially, it could be a compound, it could be an addict. We just have something that ionized and gave us a mass. Um, so this would be sort of something ionized. Uh, that's really all the information we have. We then try to climb that pyramid uh, and get to the top. Um, next step would be having some sort of unequivocal molecular formula. Um, so we're using that isotopic information like we talked about last time um, to be confident in a formula. We then maybe have some structural information. Uh, we have a potential structure that we think this may um, be the compound that we're looking at. Uh, this is usually considered like a gray zone, and it's an area that we get stuck in quite a bit. It can be difficult to get past, but hopefully some of the, the tips and tricks I, I go over in this will help you get past that step. Then we have a level two, which would be matched to, let's say, a library um, or uh, say we have some diagnostic evidence uh, up to a level one, which is where we all want to be, where we've run a reference standard. Um, so we've gone ahead, we've purchased a standard, we have a standard, we synthesized one, uh, we've run it on our instrument, we've matched our retention time, all those good pieces of evidence uh, to be confident, yes, this is the compound of interest. Last session, we talked about targeted analysis. So if we think about this as a pyramid, we really started at the top, right? Um, we knew what we were looking for, we had standards for these things. Um, so that was pretty, I don't want to say easy, um, but compared to sort of the question we're asking now, it sort of was, right? Um, we were talking about those known knowns. So last time we were really talking about, is this compound present? Do I see PFOA in my sample? Do I see atrazine in my sample? Do I see this specific protein uh, in my sample? Which is a really important question and an important question we ask a lot. Uh, we also discussed some of the known unknowns. So this would be are these compounds in this list present in my sample? Say you have a list of proteins or peptides um, that you want to screen for, you have a list of uh, metabolites you want to screen for. This would be sort of the suspect screening approach versus sort of the, the non-target question, um, the sort of dreaded question of what's in my sample. This could mean that you have no information. Uh, you have a soil sample, you have maybe a serum sample, and someone has asked you the question, what's in it? Uh, so this would really dive into those unknown unknowns, things we don't know, we don't know. There's a little bit of the known unknowns that we'll talk about, but really we're asking that question of just what's here. And before we can kind of process the data and get into the structural elucidation, peak prioritization, we have to set up our experiment. So when we think about non-target analysis and we think about what that looks like, so what makes a study non-targeted? It's actually pretty simple, right? So traditionally we have some acquisition, we're taking that raw data, we're processing that data. You know, here we're talking about processing inside XOS, um, but it doesn't really matter. It could be a different software. We're then prioritizing peaks, et cetera, et cetera. 
And they're really the only two parts that you need to ensure um, are collected in a specific way for it to be considered a non-target study uh, would be the acquisition type or approach and then your peak detection. Um, so we'll talk about the acquisition type. Um, essentially what that means is we don't want to be collecting our data in a way that is, let's say like an MRM experiment. So we have a triple quadrupole we're probably all familiar with. If we were doing an MRM experiment, we're looking for a specific parent, specific fragment, um, we, that would be a targeted study, right? So that would definitely not be a non-targeted study. And we'll dive into that a little bit more, um, but then there's peak detection. Um, so peak detection, uh, I won't go into in great, great detail, just because depending on the software you use, um, that algorithm is going to be a little bit different, uh, but they do share some sort of common characteristics and sort of the approach is the same. Uh, when we do peak detection for a non-targeted study, we're not giving our software any information of what specifically to look for. So we're not saying, hey, I want you to look for atrazine. I want you to look for the mass of this peptide. Instead, we're scanning through our, our mass range. Um, and you can kind of think of, it's not exactly the same, but you can kind of think of the mass range um, where each of those individual little masses represents a channel. Kind of if we go back to uh, UV days or earlier times, we're, we're talking about picking out peaks that are present in specific channels, which would be a mass. Uh, and they have to meet certain criteria. Signal to noise is usually one, Things like uh, peak quality, which would be like asymmetry, et cetera, uh, would be considered a, a, a condition that would need to meet to be considered a peak. Um, but the big thing is that we're not telling it what peaks to pick. Uh, the software is just identifying all peaks. So if we've done those two steps, we have some non-targeted data or data that we can at least query in a non-targeted fashion. So if you're ever asked, um, do you want to acquire the data or do you want to process the data? Uh, if you want to spend you know, only a couple of days, uh, I would say definitely acquire the data because the data processing is, that's the hard part in non-target analysis. Acquiring the data is pretty easy. Processing the data is, is where it, it takes a little bit of time. So for that question, for our unknown screening approach, we really have two sort of methods we're going to use. We're going to talk about a data independent approach and a data dependent approach. Both would be acceptable for a non-target study, um, but we'll kind of talk about the pluses and minuses uh, in this specific context. Um, both of these approaches though are for the MSMS data. So when we think of a QTOF instrument uh, and we think of a server scan or that MS1 scan, that TOF MS scan, um, that's just scanning through a mass range, right? So we've set a mass range, we've told it to scan from 50 Daltons to, let's say, theoretically 1,000 Daltons, whatever makes sense for your study. It doesn't really matter uh, what mass those compounds are, what those compounds are, so long as they ionize. So we've already done a really good job at having a non-targeted approach for MS1. Now we have to discuss how to do that for our MS2 data. Uh, if we think back to sort of that Shemansky index, right, uh, without MSMS data, we really can't ever get past that level four. Uh, we'll have a formula, yes, we might have a very specific formula, which is awesome. Um, and that might be good enough for the study you're doing, which is totally fine. Um, but a lot of times if we're trying to get to a, a true identification of an unknown, um, we can't really do that without MSMS data. In fact, we can't do that without MSMS data. Uh, so we need to acquire that data in an approach that's sort of reasonable and appropriate for this kind of study. So data dependent acquisition just means that we've given it some sort of information. Um, this could be a neutral loss. This could be a product iron. If you see this uh, neutral loss, I want you to collect MSMS data, for example. Uh, most of the time, though, if not 99% of the time, we're doing something like an intensity interval. So in this case, all of the features um, or uh, features present in my TIC, this is, would be just a moment in my TOF MS scan. All of the features that are above my intensity threshold uh, will be candidates for MSMS. So MSMS will be triggered on them and we'll collect some data, which is awesome. Um, I've kind of exaggerated this a little bit and made it so only four compounds met this criteria, um, just to kind of drive home the point that there is a chance that you set this intensity threshold too high. And maybe there are compounds of interest uh, that fall below it. 
And that's okay. Um, but if you're in a scenario where, let's say you're sample limited, um, you can't re-inject for whatever reason, you may miss some of that MSMS data, uh, which would mean that you can't really get past that level four zone. Or uh, at the best case scenario, we just have to re-inject um, to acquire MSMS data on these things. Uh, it doesn't happen a whole lot. There are lots of ways we can sort of mitigate this from happening, um, but it's it's something that could happen, right? Um, that being said, if you're doing true structural elucidation work, uh, this might be preferable because you're going to have the cleanest spectra possible. So maybe that's maybe that's your goal. But a lot of folks opt for the data independent acquisition approach. Um, so SIEX, we call that SWATH, um, and the way I like to describe it is just a sliding window. So our first window in this example would go from 100 to 120 M over Z. So anything in that mass range would go through our Q1, be fragmented in Q2, and its fragments would be read on the detector. Uh, and then that window is just shifting. So it's shifting through our entire mass range that we sort of set, depending on our study. Uh, and this is great. So we never end up in that scenario where there potentially could be missed MSMS data. And no matter what, we have this sort of digital archive of our data set that we can mine. Regardless though, um, any of these three approaches, whether we're collecting data, MSMS data on everything, whether we're doing swath um, or data independent or data dependent acquisition, um, all can be used in a non-target study. Um, they all have pluses and minuses. Uh, it just depends a little bit on what your goal is. Okay, great. Um, so we've acquired our data, we've picked our peaks, um, but now we're in a point or at a point rather where we have to prioritize what we spend time on. So this is uh, a really important step that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on because it's it's crucial, right? Uh, I remember when I did my first non-targeted study, it was on hydraulic fracturing wastewater and I took a sample, ran it on our QTOF, and I had 4,000 features. So there are 4,000 things that the software detected as something I should investigate. Um, and I was pretty keen on graduating, so I certainly did not have time to go ahead and go through 4,000 features. It, it just wasn't realistic. So I had to use some approaches to prioritize that data. And here are just a couple of sort of the most commonly used ones that I've seen. Uh, and we'll go through each one and how that can kind of add value to the study you're, you're trying to accomplish. Um, so the first one would be data-driven. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, um, data-driven approaches are a really good way to first explore your data set. Um, so when it's you know hot off the presses and you just want to kind of peek around, um, this approach can work really well. Um, but uh, it's, it's a little outdated now that software has gotten so much better. Um, for some studies, it might be totally fine, but I think for the majority of us, um, we're probably not going to only use this approach. Um, so a data-driven approach would be something like choosing the top 10 peaks and interrogating those. So if you think about it, instead of looking at 4,000 peaks here, I'm just looking at these top 10. The assumption here is that these top 10 make up the majority of my sample, right? Their intensity and area are so large that this is probably the highest concentration things in my sample, therefore they're the most important. That may or may not be true. Uh, the example I like to use is from a group out in Washington. Um, they're investigating a fish kill. Um, there is a, essentially a bunch of coho salmon that were dying in streams. And Ed and his group there had researched this for a very long time. Um, and I remember seeing a ton of presentations where they're trying to figure out what is causing this massive salmon die off. And they went through, they did non-target analysis, um, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually they found the component that was doing it. Uh, it was a compound called 6PPDQ. And this was a pretty minor component in the overall TIC of what they were looking at, right? They had real surface water. Um, it was not terribly complex, but certainly I would consider it complex, especially considering their street runoff. Um, there are a lot of things there. And the compound that they were most interested in, uh, the one that they're trying to sort of get the answer, was the answer to their puzzle, um, was a minor component. So if we chose this approach, uh, it, it wouldn't really be appropriate for that kind of study. The next uh, way we can use data-driven approaches is by basically just saying, 
I want to look at the things that are much larger in my sample than some sort of control. Um, a lot of times this might be a blank, maybe an extraction blank, um, or it just might be a control in general. Um, so this would be a non-statistical way of doing this. It's just a ratio, right? Um, so what you would do, um, here's an example in SAGSOS, but you could do this in Excel, et cetera. Um, we're basically just going to take the max area and some blanks. Um, so you could do an average. I usually do the max um, of my extraction blanks and say, what's the area in my sample? divided by the area of my blank, and if it's greater than 10, um, then I'm going to be interested. This is honestly just a really good approach for all data processing, doing blank filtering uh, is what is most commonly referred to as. Uh, it probably isn't a great approach uh, for data prioritization uh, if you have really complex samples, because there's probably going to be still maybe a couple thousand features that meet this criteria. Um, if you have relatively simple samples or you sort of a control in an experiment, it can it can sometimes work. It's, it's pretty easy, um, which is a benefit. Uh, and you can do this based on area or intensity, um, kind of up to you uh, and the data that you have. So those are some, sort of the most basic ways we can prioritize peaks. Um, but regardless of which approach we use, we're still in this level five, right? We haven't really gained any information. We just know this is the feature I want to spend time on. So what about library screening? Um, so this is probably the, I would argue, almost the most common sort of non-target approach uh, for processing data. And you're probably thinking if you're here last time, that doesn't make sense, Carl. You told me that library screening is a suspect screening approach. And this is where there's a little bit of um, a nuance. It, it, there's, it can be both uh, is essentially the answer. It all depends if we think back to that workflow, how we picked our peaks. So what was our peak detection method? If we decided to say, hey, look for atrazine and then match it to a library spectra of atrazine, that would be a suspect screening approach. We've given it information. We've said, look for the specific compound and match it to a library. Um, when you're doing it in a non-target fashion, you would be doing your peak picking by saying, hey, what features, what peaks are present in my sample? After you've done that, do any of these match um, my library? Uh, and this is pretty powerful. Um, it can depend on your library. That's the most important part, right? What library are you using? Um, when I did this, if we go back to that example of the hydraulic fracturing wastewater, um, I had 4,000 features. I think I maybe got 20-ish, maybe 30 um, library hits. Uh, granted, this was quite a while ago. Um, libraries have gotten a lot better and a lot bigger. Um, things like the NIST library, which is, is, is huge, um, and then Mona, which is also a really great resource. Um, have helped this process so you don't end up in that scenario where there's just not a lot of spectra for you to query. Um, but regardless, it's still a non-target approach. Um, same thing as we were doing in the suspect screening portion, we're using that fragmentation information uh, to say, is this a good match or not? The only difference here is the peak detection method. Did you tell it to look for this compound or did it find it as a feature? And in doing so, we actually end up at a level two. Um, so this is great. Um, it's a great bang for your buck, right? Um, we've got all those little pieces of information like the mass error, because we know the formula from the library. And we also have the MSMS data that we can say, yes, this is a spectral match. It's present in my library, we're good to go. Um, so this is something that I think most folks do uh, is sort of a first pass. Um, and it's certainly an easy way to prioritize peaks. Is it in my library? Well, what happens when it's not in your library? Um, so what happens when you're looking for something and it's you screened your sample, you maybe ended up like me with 20 hits, um, but you've got a few thousand features that now you have to go through and decide, am I gonna spend time on this or do I need to move on? And that's where compound specific characteristics can often be really helpful. Um, so the first one I'll talk about um, is homologous series screening. And this is just an example of one of these kind of approaches. Um, so I, at the time, was very interested in polymers. I wanted to identify what polymers were present in my sample. So I chose this approach. And this approach essentially says, if I think about all of my features in space, 
And I want to be able to tell the difference between what is a homologous series and what isn't. I'm going to say, do any of these features differ by the same repeating unit? Um, and does that occur multiple times? Because in a homologous series, I'd expect there'd be multiple members. Um, so you could set the rule at maybe three. And that's essentially what I did um, and went through this sort of feature space and said, what are related? And in doing so, um, I got a lot of compound specific information, right? Because based on that mass shift, I could tell what that repeating unit of that polymer was, um, which gives me some information about its structure. Great. Um, I end up here, for example, I know there's a mass shift of essentially like 50 Daltons, um, if we're rounding, uh, which is a CF2. So I'm saying this is likely a fluorinated compound. So that can be huge. That's a great way to sort of go through my data set. Um, but what if you're not interested in polymers? Um, what if you're interested in maybe a specific compound? Uh, so this is actually a study that I'm just currently working on. Um, that's a lot of fun. Uh, so I went ahead and purchased a bunch of nutraceuticals, um, these dietary supplements um, that were over the counter from uh, a bunch of gas stations. Uh, and in one of those supplements, I found a prescription drug, um, sildenafil. So that was present in my sample. And I had the question of, well, if I see this compound, are there any other impurities of this compound present uh, when they're synthesizing it or wherever the source was sourced from? Um, were there impurities there? Uh, you could do the same thing with maybe you're looking for a specific metabolite, a degradation product. You're saying, hey, is anything related to this parent compound present or this compound class present? And the way to do this is through diagnostic ion screening or characteristic ion screening, depending on what terminology you want to use. So you have your spectra um, that you're going to use as sort of your reference, uh, and you're going to identify the components there or the, the fragments there, really. Uh, and then you're going to query your data set or all the MSMS -MS data in your data set and say, do those fragments appear? If so, what is the parent mass? I want you to pull out that peak. Um, so in almost every other approach we talk about with data prioritization, we're working from MS1 and then we're going to MS2. So we're using the MS1 to decide if this is important. And then we're taking the fragmentation data to essentially confirm an identity. This is kind of fun and a cool way to interrogate your data because you're going the opposite way. You're saying, hey, is any are any of these fragments present? If so, then what's the MS1 data? So you're, you're kind of uh, approaching your data set from two different angles, which usually means you can be a little bit more comprehensive. So in this example, I said, hey, are any of those fragments present? Here's my parent compound or the compound that I identified as prescription drug. Are there any impurities? And when I extracted the MSMS data, there are about 20. So there are 20 compounds here um, that were related to sildenafil. Um, I know the structure, obviously, of sildenafil, so I can get a pretty good guess at what these compounds are based on their fragmentation, or what their structures are, rather, based on their fragmentation, uh, which means that I've got a little bit of information. Uh, in fact, a lot of times I'll have enough information to actually make my way to a level 2B because I have this diagnostic information. The structure is very similar. Maybe there's an extra methyl group or um, a slight difference in the structure uh, that we can easily identify. So this is great. Um, a good way to sort of answer that question, are there any compounds of this class? Are there any similar compounds present in my sample? But what if your question is a little bit more broad? Um, so what if your question is more along the lines of what makes this different? Um, what makes this the same? And that's where statistical analysis and statistical approaches are really, really valuable. So we'll talk about a couple um, basic ones that you can use um, depending on the question you're trying to answer. So if, maybe if we kind of like think back, maybe even to undergrad um, about statistics, right? Maybe it's been a while. Um, there are two sort of primary approaches when we're talking about univariate statistics. Um, there's parametric, so kind of is my data normal, more or less, versus non-parametric, is my data not? And the cool thing about non-parametric uh, analysis is it's really powerful, even in the case where my data isn't um, normalized. Uh, you can obviously normalize your data, but 
non-parametric tests can be still really, really useful. Um, depending on the question you want to answer, uh, you might choose a different test. Probably the most common one I come across are um, what makes these two groups different. Um, so I have an experiment, I have a control, right? We can all imagine that. What makes these different? And that's where you do something like a t-test or a man whitney um, but you can get more advanced right you can say are these groups changing over time um, are there any changes between points etc cetera, etc cetera, where maybe you want to do something like an anova um, but this is a really good way to sort of distinguish what's different between groups and i've got an example of that here um, so here we have a soil column study where we're simulating a spill and on the other side we have a control and I wanna know what makes these samples different. So what makes my control different than my, my spill? Were these compounds just present in my soil or are they related to the spill? Did they break through my soil column? Were they um, degradation products, et cetera? So in doing my t-test, uh, I end up with this result. And this is usually how you'll see this data presented in what we call a volcano plot. And it's actually pretty easy to read um, and it can be pretty valuable. So all of these different colors um, represent just a different sampling point. So you don't really have to think too hard about those, um, but just know that each one of these dots represents a feature. So each one of these dots is a unique retention time and a unique mass. And I'm just trying to figure out what I should actually spend my time on. So if we look at our volcano plot on the left-hand side, we'll have features that were higher or had a higher intensity in my control. If we look at the right-hand side in that orange, those are features that were higher in my experimental. And the way we're gonna sort of process this is, is what do we care about? In this sense, in a lot of senses, I would imagine you care about what was higher in my experiment. So you're gonna kind of be gravitated towards that right-hand side. And if you look at the y-axis, we're talking about p-values. Um, obviously, depending on who you talk to, the p-value um, importance changes quite a bit, but let's just pretend we're only interested in things that are less than 0 0.05. Well, that ends up being not a lot of compounds. So these compounds are significantly higher, uh, and that's the key word, right, uh, in my experimental column. In this case, I ended up with about eight um, that I could then go through the process of trying to do some structural elucidation. So great. Um, we went from, you know, a few thousand features to now just a couple. And that's really the importance uh, and the value of these peak prioritization approaches. The other thing you've probably heard about, um, if you're sort of getting into the non-target world, certainly, um, at least at a one-on-one -on -one level, uh, would be some multivariate analysis. And there's really two different approaches here, or two different kind of like test uh, approaches. There's a supervised technique and an unsupervised technique. Both are important and both you're going to want to perform, um, but both do very different things. Um, so a supervised approach, I like to sort of use the oversimplification of I've given my, my data um, some sort of group. I've essentially distinguished that these two things are different, I've said they're different. Um, so this test is more for confirmation. Um, it's good for telling you why these are different. You've already told the test that it's different. So it's kind of pulling apart what makes them different um, versus a unsupervised technique, which is usually what we do first um, when we're exploring our data, which is a good way to investigate our data, try to figure out any trends, et cetera. Um, it can be really valuable for going through and saying, are there different groups you can appear in before we sort of get to that confirmation stage. How does this data look um, when you're sort of going through it and deciding? Um, so on the left-hand side, you see a loading plot that has my samples. Um, so this is summarizing my samples. Um, on the bottom, on the x-axis, you'll see principal component one. And on the y-axis, you have principal component two. Um, so these are just the, the two largest um, sort of variables in my data set. And all that I'm doing is plotting the samples and where they fall in this space. Um, the number of components you have is going to depend on your data set, uh, and you can figure out that value. Um, it comes from the eigenvalue, but we're not going to get super into that. Uh, most softwares now will tell you uh, what your eigenvalue is and be pretty explicit about how many principal components you have. Um, but here, 
basically what I'm seeing um, is all the samples in red fall in the negative space of my PC1 versus all the samples in blue and the positive space, I can use this as a variable, to try to figure out what is causing that shift. On the right hand side would be my loadings plot with my features. So each one of those dots represent a feature in space. Um, and here I just have it represented as a 3D space. So those features are what driving are what is driving this change, right? So if we look at this example here, I've got um, some cannabis samples. Uh, so these are all different cannabis strains, and we are trying to figure out uh, what makes them similar and what makes them different. Uh, is it the name, for example? You notice some of these have pretty fun names. And one of the things that jumps out is mimosa. Uh, happens to be all the way on the right hand side of my PC1 um, and negative in my PC2. It's very different than others. So maybe my question is what's driving this difference? Uh, I would then go to my features plot on the right hand side and say, okay, the features that fall in that quadrant are the ones that are important. Uh, so just like I did with the t-test here, I'm just prioritizing what features uh, I need to look out to figure out why mimosa is so different than my Ghost Eye OG popcorn, for example. So using this approach, um, just like before, we're reducing the number of features, but we're really only getting to that level five. We're not sort of making it past that point, um, but that's okay. Um, we are not necessarily trying to climb the pyramid yet. We're just trying to figure out what to spend our time on. So if we think about um, sort of these approaches and, and just kind of summarize them, uh, data-driven is very easy. Um, it doesn't require much effort. Um, you're trying to kind of answer the question of what components are sort of the highest concentration. That might not be true. You're making a little bit of an assumption there, but um, it does a good job of just sort of preliminary exploration. Library searching. Um, this is something that I would just recommend you do. Um, uh, unless your question doesn't make any sense for you to identify compounds, which that's probably not the case, but um, it can require a lot of computing power. And your success with this sort of approach is really going to depend on the quality of your library. So not only the, the amount of compounds present, um, but also the quality of that spectra, right? Uh, as we think about some of these larger libraries that are community-based, they're awesome, um, but Maybe they were collected with a different instrument than what you're using or a different collision energy. Those are things you're going to have to account for uh, when you decide to use them. Compound specific um, characteristics. This is actually one of my favorite ways to query a data set when it's appropriate um, because you're identifying things that are of a compound class related to a, some sort of parent compound. Um, maybe you're trying to get after metabolites. Um, it can be a really fun way to sort of tease out what's important. Uh, if your question is, you know, what is related to this compound? Uh, there are some sort of limitations in the sense that you do need some, a little bit uh, more software. Usually it's a little bit more advanced um, because most software approaches are really designed to go from MS1 to MS2. And here we're talking about going from MS2 to MS1. Um, so we do that in SACS OS, um, but depending on what software you're using, that, that might be challenging. And then statistical analysis. Um, this is great at telling the difference between groups, um, which I think is what we're trying to do a lot of the time or identifying trends. Um, it still will land us in that level five zone and it does require some statistical knowledge, um, but it's very, very powerful. Um, and regardless, it, it allows you to go from something that's overwhelming, maybe 4,000 components, maybe even if, I mean, even a few hundred features uh, is, is overwhelming, right? If you wanted to truly identify each one. Um, so being able to focus in on a handful um, is, is very valuable and a big time saver, which is kind of the goal of this, right? To save our time. All right, but we've done this. Let's pretend we did our t-test um, and we want to now identify a compound. So here I have a real example um, from that, um, hydraulic fracturing wastewater spill. I had this peak, it was prioritized. I've decided I need to know what it is. The first thing I'm going to do is climb a pyramid, right? I need to figure out what its formula is. So I could try to match this 388 to a formula. And if I did that, I would be 
probably wasting a little bit of my time um, because if I look closer at my data, I notice that this 371 is exactly 17 uh, M of Z away, or 17 Daltons away in this case, uh, which means that the peak I'm looking at is probably an ammonium addict. The way to figure this out would be to say, all right, if this is an ammonium addict, let's look at my data set. So this is my TOF MS, my survey scan. Do I see other addicts? And in fact, I do. Um, I see this sodium addict. I see the potassium addict. I have my ammonium addict. So um, with these pieces of evidence, I can be really confident, hey, this is actually my M plus H. Um, 370 is actually my neutral mass. So that's huge, right? Um, we've gone from that 388, we would have ended up with a nitrogen in a formula that didn't make sense. Um, it would have been confusing um, to knowing that this is in fact a ammonium addict and we can tell whatever sort of formula finding software you're using that this compound or this uh, 388 is actually the ammonium addict. So we're just gonna give it that information. Now, a lot of software will do, it, do this pretty automatically. It will search through your MS1 data and say, if it thinks it's an addict, um, but it's, it's good to know sort of what's going on and how it's doing that. So let's take this data and figure out what the formula is. So here I've got my 388. I've let it know that this is my ammonium addict um, and it's come up with all the formulas that could potentially match. And you can see I've got five. So now I have to go through and figure out what formula it actually is. Um, and I purposely made it so there are a bunch of extra formulas here. So we're going to use a couple things to figure this out. Um, the RDB, so the ring double bonds. So how many rings double bonds does it have? Um, does that make sense? And then primarily we're going to rely a lot on the MS1 error and the MS2 error. So it's already done sort of the heavy lifting. It, look at, it looked at the isotope pattern um, and said these formulas fit the isotope pattern. Um, but there's some error here. Which one do you actually want to proceed with? And when I look through my data, so, you know, something like 10 RDB, that's really high. That's probably not likely what I'm looking at, especially when I pair that with evidence that the uh, MS1 error for this formula number five is, you know, seven and a half ish um, PBM. So there's a ton of error there. Um, this likely isn't worth investigating much further. And I can continue. Remember, if we go back to the fundamental session when we we're talking about sort of what error we can expect um, for MS1 data on a QTOP instrument, we're talking about, you know, under two um, is really where we're shooting. Under five, you know, I'll still consider it, but really under two is, is where we want to be for our MS1. For MS2, especially looking at it in this sense, um, it's a little bit different, right? Um, so it's going through and saying, can I apply this formula to all of the fragments I've observed in the MSMS spectrum? If so, it gives it a good score. If not, it gives it a poor score. Um, but that error is really a, a sum or a average of all the error in your MS2 data. Um, and we give it a little bit more room usually, um, specifically if you're dealing with smaller fragments. So if you're dealing with a fragment, you know, under 50 Daltons, let's say, um, and you're talking about parts per millionaire, uh, you can end up in zones where there's only a tiny little mass shift, um, but it is perceived as this large error, even though when we're talking about it in milli Daltons, it's very small. Um, so typically I'll allow about 10 uh, is usually acceptable uh, for the MS MS error, just because that's the way the data is being handled. And when I use all these pieces of information, I say, okay, um, the best option that I want to interrogate further is the C16H3409. Um, so that's what I'm going to use to try to figure out what the structure of this compound or this feature is. And to do that, um, I'm going to take the easy approach first. I'm going to search a database. Um, these databases are huge now, um, and it would be a shame not to use them. Um, so if you think about two of the largest ones, we're talking about ChemSpider and PubChem. There are other ones that exist um, that are great too, specifically if you're looking at like um, certain metabolites, uh, plant metabolites, for example, maybe you wanna use that database. Um, but in general, we'll touch just talk about PubChem. So I'm gonna go through and say, is this formula present in PubChem? And if so, what is the structure? 
right? Uh, and if we think about the distribution of compounds in PubChem, we're kind of skewed a little bit towards those smaller molecules, which is great for this, um, because this is a small molecule, right? We're talking about 388, that's, that's not huge. Uh, and we know that it's not doubly charged, for example, because we had that addict information um, to justify. So I went through PubChem and I picked my structure. This can be as simple as just downloading the mole file. Um, it's, it's not super complicated. Um, you'll go into whatever database you want to use. There will be some structural information there, um, or hopefully in this approach, yes. Um, we can download that, and then we're going to use some structural elucidation software to try to figure out if this makes sense. So it matched to this polyethylene glycol. The next step, um, I used SciXOS, um, but you could use other software, and we'll talk about it in the next coming slide. Um, does this make sense? Um, can I identify these fragments with this compound? Do I see these fragments present? Um, and in fact, I do. Um, so I just went through and said, match these two things, essentially. Um, can I create these fragments out of the structure? Uh, and I can. And my rule of thumb usually is to try and describe 70% of the intensity of your MSMS spectra, specifically if you have more than five fragments. If you have under five fragments, um, then it's a little bit of, you know, you got to decide if it's worth it or not, um, because if there's only one fragment, for example, and you can identify, yes, this structure potentially could make that fragment, well, then you've described 100% of your intensity, but it's really based off one thing. Um, so do you want to purchase a standard, yes or no? It can kind of depend on, on how nice uh, the person who signs off on your expense reports or how nice your PI is. Um, but if you have five fragments and you're explaining over 70% of the intensity, then I think you totally are justified in trying to purchase the standard or proceeding with trying to get the standard synthesized for confirmation. But at this point, right, we'd be at that level three. Um, you could argue maybe a level 2B, um, but I feel very comfortable saying we're at that level three zone of, yes, this is the tentative structure that I think this compound is. Now that was using SciXOS, um, but there are a lot of different approaches for querying these data sets. Um, I just have sort of my top three favorite here um, for structural elucidation. Uh, Metfrag uh, is an open source tool, so is CFMID and then CSI Finger uh, as well. Uh, these do a really good job at taking information from databases and sort of doing the structural elucidation to figure out if this compound makes sense. Um, I won't go into going through them um, in this talk, uh, maybe later if people are really interested in it, um, but it's definitely a couple tools that I would uh, say you should investigate. This is the kind of workflow you're doing. Um, they're great complements to the tools that are already in SciXOS. The one I use most frequently, um, I'll be honest, is Sirius. I find the interface very user-friendly. Um, it's, it's very easy to navigate um, and it's built off of machine learning. So they went ahead and said, you know, here are a bunch of structures with known MSMS data. Here's the MSMS data. Um, Use machine learning to identify what part of the structure, for example, um, made those fragments and then sort of turned it loose on the, the whole pub, pub, PubChem database and a few others. Um, so really valuable tool if you get a chance to go check out. Um, it is open source. Um, so you can go ahead and just make an account for free. Awesome. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, I know we're talking about you know 101 level things here. Um, so hopefully that's enough to sort of get you started or at least thinking about started of how do you make a non-target study. Um, the first step, right, we need to decide how are we going to acquire our data? How are we going to pick our peaks? That's crucial. Um, without that, you may or may not have a non-targeted study. The next step is really for you. Um, and it's for your peak prioritization, right? Uh, you will end up, if you have a complex sample, for example, you may end up with thousands of features, hundreds of features, um, and we all have timelines. We all have we're trying to either graduate, finish a project, um, report to our bosses, um, to the R&D group about what's working, what's not working. Uh, we, we can't go through and just identify every single compound. Um, it, we could, but usually there's just not enough time for that. So prioritizing what's important is really key. 
And then figuring out that unknown component, right? We're going to always try to climb our way up the pyramid. If you have some structural information, that's awesome. Uh, if not, you're going to be using that off MS data, that MS1 data to figure out what your formula is. From there, usually we're talking about doing a database search. Um, if it's if not in a database, for example, um, you'd likely need some additional information before you'd want to just start drawing structures unless you're fantastic at that. I, I rely on my databases quite a bit. Um, from there, we're going to use a tool, right? We're going to use a tool to figure out does that structure make sense regarding this MSMS data that we collected. So all going back to how we collected that data. But most importantly, um, the approach you use and sort of how you tackle this is really going to depend on the question you're trying to answer um, and what your goal is with that data set. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. <laughs>